Jews. Therefore, a person that is a Jew, be converted, be recognized or not, uh, Christ, Yeshua, as the Messiah, you cannot call that person a Gentile because he's not a Gentile. The Gentiles, the Goyim, are all those persons that are not Jewish. Therefore, one thing is to be a Jew, one thing is to be a Gentile, and logically there are Gentiles that are Christians or converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jews that also have converted to the Lord Jesus, but the one that is Jew being converted or not converted uh, is, does not mean that when the, you convert, then you can be called Jew that is converted, and if not Gentile, no, no, not at all. Do not mix terms, there are different things. And talking about the Messiah, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, there are two persons that uh, make, let's say, some questions that have a re relationship, a relation with an another, one another. One is from Mexico, and she says, "What? Why is there documents that have come out to light that where they are sure that the etymological roots of the name of Jesus point that that name is Panized means speak?" Can you please clarify this? I don't know what documents, hidden documents that have come out to the light you are talking about. They have had to be very hidden because they don't have a true uh, clue of what uh, you are saying. It's the first time in my life that I listen to this. The name Jesus has not any relationship, not whatsoever etymologically uh, with this word, with this animal. The name Jesus is a tra translation from the Greek and is a name that we use when we finish our prayers. As you, If you pay attention to the prayer that I just did, I have finished it and I have said in the name of Jesus. You don't have to have any fear of saying that name, not at all. If you speak Spanish, then it's logical for you to do your prayers in the name of Jesus. If you speak English, then in the name of Jesus, or if you are Jew, in the name of Yeshua, but you don't have to have any shame, any fear of saying the name of Jesus. On the contrary, on the other hand, another person uh, says that in a study, in a preaching that I did a while ago that was titled The Sufferings of the Messiah, that uh, was mentioned that the real name of the Lord Jesus Christ is not Jesus. Well, let's see. We, what we speak, and when we uh, talk to the Lord, we speak in Spanish. In Israel, logically, our brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ, they do not pray at the end of the Jesus saying in the name of Jesus. They say it in Hebrew because they pray in Hebrew. The original name of our Lord Jesus Christ was Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, which is the title that is the anointed one or the Messiah, that is Christ and means anointed one. So therefore, if you speak Spanish, address to the Lord in your own language, use the name of Jesus without any fear, without any shame. You are not pronouncing anything strange or real. You don't have to say, what do I have to do now? How do I pray? Pray with all the freedom in the name of Jesus, all the prayers that millions and millions of, uh, of brothers do all over the world, they say in the name of Jesus. So God does not listen to those prayers? They are not biblical? Not at all. So if you are German, you have to uh, pronounce the name of Jesus in German. If you are Dutch in Dutch, if you are Russian in Russian, etc., etc. Therefore, of course, that I said that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the real one, is not Jesus Christ. He was called Yeshua Mashiach the Lord, the Messiah, or the Lord Jesus Christ. But please, don't be worried uh, because you have heard that documents that are hidden have come out to the light. Forget about all of this. The Bible says in the name of Jesus, and in the, in the name of Jesus we pray, and in the name of Jesus the Lord acts, answers and does miracles and wonders. So continue to use with all freedom that name. And if you I pray in the name of Jesus, there is not a problem, nor nothing that we have, we have to be ashamed of, okay? There is a sister called Mary uh, that she, sa she says to us, she asks us if we can explain to her Luke chapter 12, verse 38. Let's read it. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, Blessed are those servants. I always recommend that you read the entire passage. Uh, this story titled The Watchful Servant begins in the verse 35 and ends at verse 40. 
And we have read a text that goes inside a context. What is the objective of these words from our Lord Jesus Christ? For us to be girded and uh, our lamps be lit. This is what the teaching points. What the words of our Lord Jesus Christ is saying at the end, you too be ready, be prepared, because you don't know at what time the Son of Man is going to come. That about the second watch or the th third watch was the way in which time was divided. At that time, they were not they did not speak about seconds or minutes but time was divided in different watches so the objective of this is or what the lord wants to teach is it doesn't matter what time the lord comes if it is in the morning at night uh, at three in the afternoon eight at night five in the morning uh, it is it's the same the day and the time the important thing is for us to be prepared to be watching and praying so the things of the last days including the coming of the lord jesus christ does not surprise us like a thief in the night so these are of the visions i know we don't use these terms generally except some countries but was the way in which the time was divided but the goal the objective is to be prepared at all times and in everything and knowing this and doing this we have met the objective for which the Lord Jesus Christ told or said this story titled the servant the vigilant servant and now more than ever we have to be watching and praying paying a lot of attention to what is happening because we are in the last days i don't know if you knew this i remind you we are in the last days christ is coming soon prophecies that have been written a long ago centuries ago they have been there like sleeping if you allow me the expression they are being fulfilled others are about to be fulfilled therefore do not lose time make the most of the time because the lord is coming back soon and we don't have to get entangled in things of this world because i remind you that we are passing by and our citizen citizenship is the kingdom of heaven and here we are passing by to meet some objectives some goals that the lord has put in front of us and for us to carry out those works that they were prepared in advance and selected by the Lord Jesus Christ for each one of us. So therefore, watch and pray that your lamps be lightened and do not turn off like those virgins uh, of the parable. And that uh, regardless of the time that the Lord comes, let us be waiting and let us be ready. Teresa asked about uh, if the woman that is mentioned in Matthew chapter 15 and in Mark chapter 7, where one hand is said the Canaanite woman, in another part it says that it was, she was Greek, that was Syrophoenician. I remind you that Phoenicia was a Roman province of Syria. If it is the same woman, yes, indeed, it's the same woman. Uh, gives us information, Mark gives us some information, Matthew, another information, uh, but it's the same woman. Uh, some part, uh, some gospel is called and said that it was Greek, also that was Canaanite, that lived in the region of Canaanite, Canaan near Syria, Syria, Phoenician, but we are speaking about the same person, the same woman. woman. Miriam, a sister called Miriam says, is it true that the Christians, when we die, angels come and pick us up and take us to the presence of the Lord? I read uh, a long ago the parable of Lazaro and the rich, and it says that uh, Lazaro, the angels took him accompanied him. Could you explain this? Firstly, I want to tell you that the story of Richard Lazarus is not a parable. In the la parable, uh, names are not given. Proper names are not given. This is a real story. It's not a parable. It's like if the veil went and the Lord allowed us to see what is in the other side. Therefore, it's not a parable. It's a real story of something that happened when the rich man died and when Lazarus died. Now you ask me if Christians, when we die, if angels come to pick us up and take us to the presence of the Lord. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if angels take us or we have to go alone by ourselves. But what I do know is that when a believer dies, goes to the presence of the Lord. If he goes or she goes accompanied or uh, by angels or not, I don't know. 
But I sincerely think that the main thing is not if angels took us there or not to the presence of the Lord. I think that the important thing is to know that we have the assurance of salvation, that when we die, we don't have to have any fear that we pass directly to the presence of the Lord. There are many details, logically, that we don't know. We will know about them. Don't worry. Uh, at its due time, the Bible says, words of the Apostle Paul, for me, life to live is Christ and dying is profit. So therefore, where we live, we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. If the angels accompany us going and take us to the presence of the Lord, glory to the Lord. If non-angels take us, but we have to go alone to the presence of the Lord, we will give glory to the Lord exactly the same. The important thing is not if we go or not accompanied by angels. The important is that the believer goes directly to go to the presence of the Lord. And this is really what is important. And I take this opportunity to ask you, are you sure of your salvation? What will happen with you when you die? Some people say, well, if there is nothing, well, I ask you, and if there is something, because if there is nothing, I lived as I wanted to live. The ones that say, well, imagine that when you die, you realize that there is nothing. Well, I didn't lose anything. If there is nothing, I didn't lose anything. Therefore, I live this life as, as I wanted to live, and I choose to live this way. But imagine... Imagine that there is something. Imagine there is a God, there is heaven, there is hell, there is salvation, there is condemnation. My friend, think very seriously your life, not only here, but uh, uh, on the other life. But because I can assure you that there is life after this life, or if you prefer, life after death. So the Bible gives us a lot of details about how they are going to live, some in one place, some in another place. So think about giving your heart and your life to Jesus. Ask the Lord for forgiveness for all the things that you have done, for him to cleanse you and uh, forgive you with his mighty and blessed blood. And be sure before you die that your name is inscribed in the book of life before it's too late. Well, uh, we go to answer uh, another question that comes from Puerto Rico. A brother called Enrique says, I believe that Jesus knew when he was going to come well, uh, by the, um, for second time because he is God. He has to know everything. But uh, I stop and read with Matthew 24, 36, and I don't understand it because he says that the Son of Man does not know at what time or hour he is going to come, but only the Father that is in heaven. I appreciate your explanation a lot. God bless you. The same to you. Well, let's see. Jesus ate or not? Jesus slept or not? Jesus was tired at some times. Jesus could be in two places at the same time. We see Jesus eating. We see Jesus drinking water. We see Jesus sleeping. We see Jesus tired. We see Jesus as a human being, exactly like everybody else. But at the same time, uh, he forgave sins. He multiplied lo uh, bread and fishes. He walked above waters. Then, was he God? Was he man? Because God does not eat. God is not tired. God does not have to drink water. God does not have to sleep. If Jesus was God, then why did he eat? Why did he sleep? Why? He says that when tired from the way he sat down and that woman in the Jacob's well, the Samaritan woman from John chapter 4, asked him for a glass of water because Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. I know that for some this is difficult to accept this. There are even some sects that say that Jesus was not God and use this verse. And people that does not know the Bible, they are surprised saying, oh, if he was God, how come he didn't know the day and the hour of his second coming? He's speaking at that time, at that moment, from his human side. He's speaking as a man at that moment. He's not speaking as God. God knows everything. There is no type of limitation or of space or time of any other nature that will limit the Lord. But as man there, a submissive to the Father 100%, I know that all these terms and words, I know that for our finite and limited mind, 
I know it can be hard to understand, but we have accepted it by faith. Even we don't understand it, our faith and our trust in God allow us to believe and accept things that our mind cannot understand. But we believe that God, Jesus was man, as, as a man, he said, I don't know the day and the time, but only my father does. But as God, he did know. But he didn't come to this world manifesting as God, but as the bird made flesh and dwelt between us and we saw his glory. Emmanuel, see God with us. This is why he has to sleep, breathe, eat, rest, etc., etc. So from his humanity is where he says and declares, the day and the hour nobody knows, only the Father. But in the other hand, the, he himself, himself said, the one that has seen me has seen the Father. I know it's a very deep teaching. I know that there's people that maybe is starting the gospel. It's very hard to, under, to accept this, but we don't have any problem in believing that Jesus was God. Now, if somebody says or preach or believes that Jesus was not God, well, that's up to him with his teaching. I will have to give count before God of his teaching. But almost 99.9% .9 of Christendom will believe that Jesus Christ was God and at the same time was man. Well, having said this, we move on to the next question because there is nothing more to add because this is a, fa a matter of believing or not, accepting or not accepting. This is not a point, an opinion of a man, it's not a suggestion, it's not a proposal, it's not something that you vote in a church. I know that there are churches that they vote everything, but in the Bible it's not suggested that there should be a votation to accept if Jesus was divine or human or not, or it was both things at the same time. We believe it and we say, Amen and glory to God and that's it and we don't question anything in absolute anything at all there is also a question that is done to us by Daniel I have a question and I saw that in your eschatology lessons you mentioned a crowd dressed in white clothes and this crowd dressed in white clothes it makes reference to them before the sound of the seventh trumpet. Well, uh, let's go to Revelations chapter 7 and we're going to read the passage, okay? In Revelations chapter 7, and while we look for this passage, and I hope that you are home are also looking for it and participate with me in the reading, what does it have to do that the crowd dressed with white clothes was mentioned before the trumpets? or before the stamps. It has nothing to do. It's simply like a advanced uh, information that is given in advance before uh, the seven seals, before the seven trumpets, and before the seven uh, cups of wrath are powered. It has nothing to do. If you say it because I have preached about the seven trumpet, it has nothing to do. There is not a contradiction. In fact, not even not even the Lord Jesus Christ had come the second time, nor the rapture had come in, uh, not even the great tribulation happened, and that multitude that we are going to read now in Revelations chapter 7 from 9 to 17 was already in the presence of the Lord. People that not even at that time was born. This is a prophetic uh, information uh, that is ahead of time and that is, that is revealed to John. So let's go and read the passage, okay? Revelations 7, chapter 9. Chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I look and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes, people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. They were there already. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, and blessing, saying, Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and mighty belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one, the, there comes a very interesting question. One of the elders responded, saying to me, to John in the uh, uh, island of Padmons. These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? And where have they come from? And look at the answer from John. I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation 
and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Still, the great tribulation has not begun, but John already in a vision sees a multitude of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues in the presence of the Lord, praising and worshiping God and to the Lamb, let's say, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, is giving an information in advance prior to the start and the conclusion or completion of the Great Tribulation. Therefore, there is nothing to object or anything to question about the chronology of the times, but simply is given some information previous to the start of the Great Tribulation. They say that they are before the throne of God, they serve him day and night in their temple, and the one that is sitting on the throne will spread his tabernacle, they will have no longer hungry or thirsty, and the sun will not fall on them, because the shepherd that is in the midst of the throne will uh, shepherd them and lead them to sources of water of life, and God will wipe up every tear from the eyes of them. What difference does it make if this is mentioned before, during, or after the Great Tribulation? What we have to have in account is that this multitude of from all nations, people and tribes, John did not see them going through the great tribulation, suffering, but he saw them in the presence of the throne of God, praising the Lord and the Lamb. Therefore, it's simply an information that is given ahead of time and that John writes his it and appears in chapter 7 and in the next chapter 7 also of Revelations and from the 9, etc., etc., is giving, shedding away, is being revealed, uh, showing all the information of everything that is going to happen later on with the seven seals, with the seven trumpets, with the seven cups, and so on. Okay? We have said that the book of Revelations is a very interesting book that the vast majority except the message to the seven churches that appears at the beginning of the book is about, about to be fulfilled. And we as believers of these last times, this generation uh, so interesting in which we have uh, had to live, will have the privilege of seeing a lot of prophecies being fulfilled and to see many things happening that all other generations that came before us didn't have the privilege of being able to see them. So each generation has had its own characteristics. We are not going to see the flood. We are not going to see the construction of the first temple of, from Jerusalem. We are not going to see the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ because all of that was lived and seen and experienced by another generation. But for us, yes, we will see and experience certain and determined things that are saved for the last days and that are close to be uh, fulfilled. So we go again to what we were saying a while ago. Watch and pray because the times are being short. And this last year, I hope and I wish that many of you that you were uh, in the lockdown, that you were locked up for a long time, that you had time to pray, you had time to think about your Christianity and reflect about it and scrutinize and study the Bible. Never forget all that the Lord has been teaching us in this last time because I have the feeling that some return and go again to the what they call the normality, forgetting about this time of lockdown, and that it had to be of use and have to be of use to go deepen in our communion with the Lord and in our re uh, knowledge of the sacred scriptures, uh, say, let's, from the Bible, the Word of God. We cannot forget all that has happened. We cannot forget everything we have learned. We cannot go back to what we call in brackets, uh, the normal life that we had before, because never again life will be again as the one that we had last year, because the Lord has been speaking and dealing with the whole world as never before in the uh, history of humanity. But above all, I also think that the Lord has been dealing and speaking very clearly and directly to his love church, 
Many church have been closed, many pastors have died, but also many Christians have renewed themselves and have gotten close to the Lord as never before in their life. Therefore, let's take advantage of the time. Don't go back again to entangle in the things of this world and go again into the error of not having time to pray, not having time to uh, go to the services, not having time to serve the Lord, to read his word, because then you haven't learned anything. And here it's about learning and retaining the teaching and putting it into practice. Everything that the Lord has been teaching us and sharing with us during this last year that has been a lot. And we continue, we continue to learn every day more and more from the Lord. I encourage you to keep studying the Holy Scriptures. I encourage you not to lower your guard. I encourage you to be watching and praying because. Uh, there are things that are about to happen, tremendous things that are going to keep following, uh, they are going to keep shaking the nations. This is just a starting. We are in the last uh, 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 final stretch. It's like, like a pregnant woman when it's in labor and has pain. It announced that the baby is about to be born. And this uh, uh, pregnancy pains that the humankind are experiencing in all nations in the earth, it has to teach us that the Lord is coming back soon soon and that the church cannot be in discussions or in arguments and in ridiculous uh, discussions or crying uh, um, that is say many times that many times we are crying uh, without any use but we have to shake ourselves and we have to realize that the times are being short and that the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking and that the Lord is coming back soon. My dear brethren, we are in our first missionary trip, going through many provinces and cities, visiting our brothers and sisters from the virtual church. Many of them have given their life to the Lord. They have never been in a congregation before. We have had the opportunity of baptizing. Uh, some of them, we still have a long way to go. Uh, soon we will go to Alicante, Valencia, Cuenca, Zaragoza, Lleida, some provinces of Catalonia. We will be through the areas of the uh, Basque Country and we will go visiting to many brethren that have reconciled with the Lord and others that have given their life to the Lord during this time. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you because we feel the support uh, of each one of you. God is good. They are treating us uh, many uh, uh, brethren with a lot of love. We are visiting brother, brothers that uh, we haven't seen for a long time as our brother Paco Clemente and his wife uh, Mary here in Murcia, in Lurca. And we are very thankful to the Lord for everything that he's allowing us to live. What do you think if we end up giving thanks to the Lord, praying and asking that he keep us blessing and using us for us to extend and spread the word of the Lord and be able to guide and pastor so many people that every day come closer to the Lord and that they want to grow and want to mature. We pray to our God. Heavenly Father, blessed Father, thank you very much from the uh, deeper part of our hearts for this time that you have given us to be able to be together, to be able to learn more from your word. I ask you for each one of my brethren that come close to you, that love you, that want to serve you, that want to prepare themselves for these last days in which we are living. Keep us from all danger, from all evil, and strengthen your love church, your people, for it to keep preaching your word at time and outside time and your kingdom to be extended through all the nations of the earth. Thank you. We, we give you for allowing us to live in this generation, in this time of, his, of the story that is so interesting. We commend ourselves to you and we give the glory and the honor in the name of your loved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. My dear brothers, it has been a pleasure to be able to be with all of you. God bless you. Don't stop praying for us. We still have a long way to go and we will keep informing you every day of each one of the activities that we are doing. God bless you. Good afternoon, my dear brethren. May the Lord bless you very richly. We are here again on the here in the Canary Islands, broadcasting on live this uh, pastoral line. We have been uh, for a year, a long year, with all of you answering to many, many questions. 
I think, I believe that we have already learned quite a bit, but the most important thing is that uh, with the help of the Lord we have uh, achieved that you are awakened and in many of you have the desire to get close to the sacred scriptures, not only to read them, but to study them, to scrutinize in a deep way the word of God and in this way to have a base, a solid, a strong and a solid base, some foundation in our life to be able not to not to only stand firm against the attacks and temptations and trials and difficulties of life that the enemy sends, but also to be ready to be able to answer to this quest these persons that many times come to us and say, what do you believe this and why do you believe the other? I think it's very important, necessary and biblical to be very well prepared and more in these times in which we are living, in which many people are attacking the word of God, the Bible, God, the Christians, the church, our faith in a tremendous way without uh, any kind of scruples or objections to uh, make fun of the Bible, of our faith, of the Lord Jesus Christ, etc., etc. I sincerely believe there is our duty to be prepared for, as the Bible says, be able to make defense to everyone who asks to give an account for the hope that is in us, but with gentleness and respect. This is what is called apology, to present arguments, not to convince anyone. We are not here to convince anyone. This is not my objective, nor my goal of the, ones that is, the one that is speaking to you, to convince anyone of anything. But yes, it's my objective that at least you think you open your heart to God to his word and for you to experience for yourself, not because of pressure, but because of your own belief, the reality of God, that he loves you, that he wants to help you, that he exists, even many say otherwise, and that the word of God, the Bible, is worthy of all credibility. We don't have a blind faith, nor a foolish faith, nor absurd faith, but a faith that helps us to face the problems and difficulties of life, but also also to know that our faith is based on definite facts that can be studied. You can touch places where you can visit till the day to day, and this is why our faith is not against reason. Not reason is against the faith, but both help each other. Well, what do you think, my dear brethren, if before starting to give answers to the questions that we have received during these days, if we pray and we ask the Lord to help us and give us wisdom so we can answer the questions that you have made us and sent to us. So if you want and you can do it, I ask you to join me and together we will be praying. So the Lord will give us the necessary wisdom to be able to give answers to the question that you have sent to us. Lord Jesus, we thank you very much for your presence in our life, for what you represent, for what you are for each one of us. We pray, Lord, at this moment for you to give us the necessary wisdom to be able to help, to be able to guide, to be able to instruct in the word of God to so many, many people who need biblical answers to that question that they have done. We entrust ourselves to you. We depend on you completely. We don't trust in ourselves, nor in our experience, nor in anything, anything but we only trust in you, our God. Help us and direct this time that we together can enjoy a moment of reflection of scrutinizing your word and let us be built up in the faith we put our faith ourselves in your hands in the name of jesus amen and amen welcome brothers and sisters to the ones that are connected and the ones that will be connected in the next minutes we are going to give answer to a question that is sent to us uh, a sister by a sister. I don't know exactly from where. Her name is Miriam. And this uh, sister has the following. I was married civilly. I have been divorced for several years. 
And one of the reasons for the divorce, it seems, uh, it seems that it was very several motives, but one of the reasons was that his infidelity. And you ask, could I marry again? You answer the following in, um, you answer the following to me. And I saw the reply that you gave to my question. When I answered to you, I asked you, I had already spoken with another pastor that gave me a big answers. I would like to have an answer according to the word of no. God. Yes or no? And, I, and she makes another question also that I will reply later on. Let's see. If you have asked several pastors and you have not been satisfied seems with the answer that I gave to you, then you cannot say that the answers have been ambiguous or not biblical. Maybe what they have told you, you have not liked that. I don't know exactly what they have told you. I only read the question that you have sent to me. It's not a matter of yes or no. Because you could get married again if your husband was unfaithful. Yes, I tell you something. Yes and no. Yes and no. If you tell me that you are going to be married tomorrow with somebody that is an unbeliever, that you are in love and you want to share your life with him, then the answer is no. This is not white or black, yes or no. Can you marry if your husband was unfaithful to you? Well, some pastors will say no and others will say Yes, I think that biblically you have the freedom to be able to remarry as long, I underline, as long as is with a believer and is within the will of God. Anyway, I say this again, what I have already said many times. These kind of questions, the first thing that you have to do is go to your pastor. I'm not your pastor. Go to your pastor, because there are some congregations that they may have customs or some rules different from other congregations. So it may be that your pastor said to you, no, you cannot remarry. And another may say, yes, you can remarry. Here is not about uh, looking for the answer that we like. Here is about looking for the answer of, that the Bible gives. And I sincerely believe, sister, that in this case you can remarry. But the ideal would be for you that your marriage could be restored, regardless of what you, you, you it has been what you said. If there is no possibility, then as long as it is in the Lord, my personal opinion, and I think that I am not going against what the Word of God says, you could remarry again, as long as it's in the will of God. But anyway, the ideal, I repeat, is that you talk to your pastor and let yourself be advised by uh, him. This is what you're telling me. It's not that I doubt from your word, but um, I don't have all the information. So I would prefer that you speak and you, these kind of questions you made them to your uh, respective pastors because they know you much better than me. Okay? And at the same time, you also ask me if you can explain to you Romans 7 from one, verse 1 to 3. And I have been reading Romans 7 from 1 to 3 verses, but to understand Romans 7 from verse 1 to 3, you have to read till verse 6. We cannot take out or extract a part of the whole, because Romans chapter 7, if you want to look for it while you are at home, uh, from 1 to 6, Romans 7 from 1 to 6, is uh, talking about an analogy, analogy, an analogy taken from marriage. And what is an anal analogy? It's a relationship of uh, things that are uh, similar but are different. There are certain similarities. And here it says, or do you not know brothers and sisters for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives, for the married woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law. So if he, while her husband is alive, she 
gives herself to another man, she will be called adulteress. But if her husband dies, if she frees from the loss, she is not adulteress. Here is speaking about the death or one or the other. It's not speaking about infidelity. It's speaking about if the woman or the man uh, dies. It's not speaking about infidelity. Here, what Paul is trying to do is putting an analogy, a similarity uh, about what happens between the law and Jesus and Christ. And it takes the analogy from the marriage. So, my brothers, you have died to the law because of the, Christ, the body of Christ. You also were put to death in regard to the law through the body of Jesus, so that you might belong to another. So, the death of Jesus has freed us from the law enforcement, whether you like it or not. Some us. The husband dies and the wife is free to be able to remarry again with another man as long as he's a believer or the woman. If her husband dies, then with the death of Christ, automatically we are free from the law because Christ has freed us from the joke of the law because the law was a joke. The law was a tremendous pressure on everyone's life that people that wanted to live under the joke of the law. The law, the objective was to take us to Jesus, to Christ. But once Christ came, then the law has no longer, doesn't make any sense because now we are in Jesus, in Christ, and we are new creature. All things pass away and we are no longer under the law. And not because I say so, because the Bible says so. The Bible says that we are not under the law. We are under the grace of God, under the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why I say again that those Christians who are uh, want to keep the law, they are wrong. They are flatly wrong because they take from the law what they like, what interests them, three or four commandments, uh, the, fire, the parties, the Shabbat, but they forget that the law has 613 commandments. And the Bible says, the Bible says that if you comply with the most of them, but you break only one automatically, it's like you, if you would have not fulfilled any of them. So to leave the gospel, to return to the law is nonsense. And it's a sign of a fault of uh, uh, absolute uh, and total maturity. Yes, yes, yes. A lack of maturity. The persons that have been converted to the gospel, that were going to church, that accepted, in theory, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and now they leave the gospel to go into the law again. What they are showing is that they ha did not understand the gospel. And what they are uh, saying, implying, is that it seems that the law takes the place of Christ. And on the contrary, the law is a means. It was a means, not a, no a goal itself. So if you think that because you uh, do Shabbat or because you go, you do Pesach and afterwards Shabbat and afterwards this and the other, you are fulfilling the law, what you are doing is ridic ri being ridiculous. Excuse me for me to be so direct, but it's like this because some believers, what they do is ridiculous. Uh, and then uh, they learn four or six, seven words in Hebrew and then they think that because they celebrate Shabbat not Sunday, because it's not biblical, because I do Sukkot and Hanukkah, which is not even uh, a, a mandatory uh, feast from the Bible, and instead of saying Holy Spirit, they say Ruach HaKodesh, and instead of saying God, they say Abba Elohim, or the Eternal, instead of saying Jesus, they said Yeshua HaMashiach, then I believe that I'm superior to others, and I said once to a lady, well, I I have said it to many persons, but once I say to a lady and she started to mix the Spanish with Hebrew, and I said to this uh, lady, uh, sister, do you want to speak in Hebrew with me? Let's speak in Hebrew. There is no problem. Do you speak to Hebrew? Do you want to read the Bible in Hebrew? Let's do it. And he said, no, I don't know to, how to read Hebrew or speak Hebrew. Then why are you telling me uh, Hamashiach and Tanakh and Ruach HaKodesh if you don't know how to speak in Hebrew? 
If we speak Entonces, Hebrew or we speak pues, Spanish, ley, do not be mixing Cristo, things. Pues es como el perro que al do not mix the speed with bacon. So, to go back to the law, after having met Christ, is like the dog that goes to his vomit. The Bible says, or the pig that washes and goes and rolls again in the garbage. These are the... Uh, so-called messianic Christians who, with all my respects they are not uh, one thing nor the other nor Christians nor messianic and this gives me uh, a start to uh, give a reply to a question that sadly sadly the fact that you ask me that is question it leaves me quite surprised and I'm going to tell you why there is a family there is a family Uh, that says that in Hebrew chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4 it's a portion that I per perfectly know it says that Jesus was made so much superior to angels as soon as he inherited an excellent name and God is, and he says do you believe that God created his son Jesus Christ although later gave him all the glory and Saludos the son he made uh, the father did the son I have compared several versions and always appears the word that he was done greetings from the north of Sweden uh, a few kilometers from the Arctic Circle your brothers in Christ well I don't know si if you are asking me creó, Uh, hizo but uh, Señor you si and me uh, if we are brothers in Christ we have to have the same God esto? and if your God he made, made the Lord esto, Jesus Christ then your God is not my God notice what I'm telling you why do I tell you this I tell you this and to you and everyone who's listening and watching this afternoon no on, bright, on live no because we Christians the one that study the Bible we believe as a corner stone of our faith that God did not create did not create the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal and the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ is God. Oh, I have already touched at the sensitive fiber of Sam because Sam said to me, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe he died, I, I believe he rose again, I believe he ascended, I believe he is sitting on the right hand of the Father, I think he will return, but I do not believe that Christ is God. Then, if Christ was not God, who was he? Oh, he was created. He was created like the Archangel Gabriel was, or the angels. No, 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 no. 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 Jesus Christ is God and there have been thousands of brothers who, ha uh, who have given their lives throughout the history of Christianity to defend with their life and with their blood that Jesus Christ is blood not a created being Jesus Christ was not a created being therefore if you have consulted several, some versions I don't know which one because I have behind me a lot of Bibles and versions and in none of them not even in Greek nor in Hebrew nor in any language I have found that God made or created no nuevo, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is flatly false. No This is not taught by the Bible. This tanto, is why what some men are taught. And it's nothing new because no from first century some came coming and saying that Christ was a man, not God. So I assure you categorically with the Bible in hand that Jesus Christ was not created by the Father and that later on the Father gave him all authority and the glory. No, 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 no. This is not the gospel. This is not being a Christian. This is not the gospel. We believe, and when I say we, uh, nearly the totality of the Christian world that have a knowledge of the word of God, that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God. He was not created. He was not God's creation. Therefore, I hope that this has been very clear for all 
that we believe that Jesus Christ is God. In the beginning was the verb, and the verb was God. What do we do with this? Do we tear it from the Bible, or we change it, or we manipulate it, like the famous Jehovah Witness, that they have changed and invented their own version? Because, of course, they do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. We are not going to do this, not at all. Either we accept it, or we don't accept it. Jesus Christ is God. Of course, there are many questions that arise from all of this, logically. It's not something easy. We have, you have to have a minimum of biblical knowledge to accept all of this. But this is the cornerstone of Christianity, the basics. Jesus Christ, God didn't say, go down and die for the human beings because I made you for this. No, 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 no. This is a very deep topic, it's to talk long, but uh, I end up and conclude saying that Jesus Christ was not created by God. You are free to believe whatever you want. If you want to believe it, that's your problem. I'm not going to st stop sleeping or having dinner because people believe that Jesus was created by God. You are free to believe whatever you want. But this that is speaking to you are the Christians. We believe that Jesus Christ is God. And no Bible says that God made the Son. None. None. It may be the world, new world version of the Jehovah Witness, but not a Biblia, Bible with a minimum credibility. And I can assure you that I know many versions of the Bible. On the other hand, there is people that insist and ask and ask continuously why Jesus told Maria, don't touch me. And then later on, later on he said to Thomas, eh, put your hand and see my wounds. In the first place, we have to position ourselves in time in history in which Jesus Christ lived. A woman could not, under any circumstances, to touch a man, neither in public nor in private, that eh, only her husband. So that desire of Maria Magdalena to touch, to ask the Lord that has changed her life and that had uh, cast out demons and suddenly to see him alive after seeing him crucified on the cross, don't, the Lord stopped her impulse and said, calm, calm, don't touch me. Firstly, she knew she couldn't touch him. And when he says to Thomas, if you don't, be, Thomas, if you don't believe, put your hands here in my wounds, and the Bible does not say If, to, if Thomas did that or not. Jesus tell him, told him, if you want, put your finger in my wound. But the Bible does not say that Thomas did it. A man could touch Jesus Christ, but a woman, not under any circumstances, not in those days, not even today. This is something that is totally forbidden. This is something that won't go through a, uh, the head of a woman in that culture. Uh, On the other hand, there is a sister that says, when Jesus said, I certainly say to you, to you, today you will be with me in paradise, in that instant that Jesus died, went to paradise, the Bible also mentions that when Jesus was risen, uh, the disciples uh, saw him, he didn't let himself to be touched. How somebody can be raised to the Father is a strange question. And if somebody dies, goes to heaven, why would have to come again when Jesus came back to judge us? There is a person that tell, us, tell me that the phrase is, mis is bad written and that Jesus said, To the man on the cross, I certainly, certainly say to you today that you will be with me in paradise. Do you know why? Because they play with the commas and periods, but this does not exist with the Greek text. The point, uh, uh, the periods, all of these are uh, rules, the spelling rules of our languages, but not of the biblical languages. In Hebrew, there is no comma, nor in Greek. This is the great lie that Uh, many people, even the Jehovah Witness, they say, oh, is that Jesus said, I say, say to you today that you will be with me in paradise and they put the comma here or there. Let's see. These are inventions. These are manipulations. Of course, as many people, sadly, and I say with pain in my heart, many people, sadly, they have little biblical knowledge. They Later on, these enlightened people come and say, oh, Jesus did not say this because the comma was put in a place where it wasn't. It, commas do not exist in Greek. What are you talking about? 
Wanting to be wise, you become fools, the Bible says. The commas do not exist in Greek nor in Hebrew. They exist accents, but it's another thing. So, if he was or not in that day in paradise, to me, particularly, I don't care. What I know is that that thief was saved because he cried to, to the Lord, because the Lord promised him the paradise. If it was the five seconds after dying, or it was three days after, or it was a week and a half, or he went to paradise two months later, on the, the 30 seconds after, what's the matter? Is he or not in paradise in the presence of the Lord? All who died in Christ, including the thief that repent, yes or no? Yes, right? Then why does it matter if it was that day, it was later on, or had to wait for hours? To us, sincerely, it's not of our business. It's like if we die today. Do we go directly to the presence of the Lord? Of course. Of course. For me, living in Christ, is dying living in Christ and dying is winning so if I die five minutes I will be in the presence of the Lord I don't know I don't know if it's going to be in the five minutes half an hour three quarters of an hour really the concept the dimension of space and time when we depart from this life does not exist we move in a dimension that is totally different from the spiritual dimension when we go from this world to the presence of the Lord so if I die when I die 10 minutes I am in the presence of the Lord glory to God I, I arrive there and if three days after nothing happens I'm going to be for eternity in the presence of the Lord I'm not going to be looking oh three minutes to go two days to go it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what we have to have is the assurance of salvation that sadly many Christians do not have it you, are you saved yes or not have you passed from death to life have you been born again then this promise is for you it's for us I certainly say to you that the one that hears my word and believes has eternal life and will not come to condemnation but has passed from death to life this is called assurance of salvation eternal salvation and when we die we go directly to the presence of the Lord I don't know exactly with how difference of time because I still haven't died I still haven't been able to check it but what I know is that the believer when dies goes to a better life and this also gives me play a room to answer to a, a sister that says that she gets very sad when a, it's prayed for a sick person and it's not healed and dies. And concretely, she says to me to read, please, Isaiah chapter 53. We are going to read it. You have your Bible at hand and you want to come to me with me to this portion. However, it was our sickness that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. Yet we ourselves assume that he had been afflicted, struck down by God, and humiliated. But he was pierced for our offense, he was crushed for our wrongdoings. Isaiah 43, 4 and 5. And the question of this sister is, in what form was fulfilled Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, in which way it was fulfilled totally, 100%, in all ways, and says, if he says that he took our illness, I wonder, this sister wonders, why there is still so many sick and so many people dying? But we are missing things? What does it have to do? Let's see. Let's see. What does it have to do that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins and for our diseases? Does this mean that the human beings are not going to die? The same God did not say that the payment of the death of sin is death, and it's established by God in Hebrews 9, 27, that all men die only once and after this judgment? Does this nullify I say, uh, Hebrew 9, Isaiah 53, or they contradict each other? Not at all. We will all have to die. From Adam to the last human being, we will all have to depart from this life. If not, 
How come are we going to go to the presence of the Lord? To go to the presence of the Lord, we will have to die unless we are taken in the rapture. That I heard the other day, uh, somebody said that Pastor Manuel Sierra does not believe in rapture. You know me very little because I have been 40 years teaching about the second coming of the Lord and the rapture. So I don't know where you have taken this from. So unless you are in the rapture with the Lord, we will all have to die. But if we are praying for a brother that is sick, think well what you are going to respond. We are praying for a sister, a brother that has a sickness and we are praying for them. Because we believe that the Lord can heal. If he dies, my question is, where does this sister or brother go from this sickness? Doesn't he go to the presence of the Lord? Yes or no? What is it better, to be here in this life or going directly to the presence of the Lord? Didn't the Lord die for our sins and sickness and diseases for our in the eternity to be saved and be all eternity with Him and be in His presence without any type of disease or physical defect? Yes or not? We will be in the presence of the Lord for eternity? Yes. And why can we be with him in eternity because he died for our sins he paid the price of our sins this is why we will be able to be eternity with him we will be in the presence of the lord lame paralytics with cancers with tumors sick lepers no why will why will we be we able to be all eternity healthy free from all disease and all illness why why because he paid the price of the sin of our sin of our sickness for us to be healed in this life or not has nothing to do with our dimension and our position in eternity in the presence of the Lord so if you get sad when you are praying for a person and that person to be healed and the Lord took him to his presence then what you should say thank you because you have done your will and you have done the best for the life of this brother I don't know if you ha ever have been taught this, but I'm trying to explain to you, Sister Christina, that is the one that made this question. And in what sense have this been fulfilled? In what sense? In all, or every sense, in eternity, we are not going to be suffering our ailments that we have in the earth. Why? Because Jesus paid the price of our disease and our ailments. And this is what he had to die in the cross for us to be able to start from now to meet him, to prepare for eternity and for us to be able and have glorified bodies, transformed bodies like the one he has and for us to be able to be healthy all eternity would you imagine to be sick for all eternity but this is not going to happen because in the presence of the lord we will be at a tot level of uh, perfection total and absolute and this earth perfection does not exist we are passing by we are training for eternity this is a simple entertainment, a hobby. Haze. But the reality of our life starts when we are in his presence. Sometimes it hurts me, she says, when I see so many that are not healed, although they have begged and asked the Father for healing and also to the Lord Jesus. Then you, because, uh, there is not a problem asking for healing to the Lord Jesus. The Lord has healed a lot of people from great uh, uh, sicknesses. I can also have testimonies that the Lord healed me. But this does not mean that we are not going to die. Don't you want to go to the presence of the Lord? Unless you form part of the rapture of the church, you will also have, have to die, uh, regardless of how much we pray for you. And about the Last Supper, this sister uh, asked, the last supper in which the Lord said, do this in memory of me, this sister says that there are people that relate the uh, Holy Supper with healing and they take it thinking that they are going to be healed. Could you please clarify my doubts, please, because I don't want to be wrong in my prayers. We go again to make things that have nothing to do. The Holy Supper is not for people to be healed. I don't know who is teaching this. I have always said, and I repeat it again, that I am not responsible for what other people have taught or are teaching in their respective churches. But the Holy Supper, why do we do it? Why did the Lord say that we had to partake of the bread and the wine? To remember his death, his resurrection, and his coming back. Do this in memory of me, remembering him until I come back. 
Therefore, the enfermo, le damos un de, de pan, uh, Holy Supper is not the antidote for those who are sick. We give him a piece of bread, la, la, a piece, a little bit of wine, and automatically they are going to be healed. No this is uh, taking no uh, out a doctrine, a wrong doctrine of something that was not done or is not done with that objective. Okay? It's true that the, that the Bible says that because of participating in, 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 not, in not a worthy way of the body, of blood of, of the Lord, many are sick and weakened and others are sleeping or have death. But on the contrary, it does not say that if I take the bread and the wine, I'm going to heal from any ailment or disease. This is not what the Bible says. This is totally, I'm not saying anti-biblical, but it's not correct to tell to the people, come to church on Sunday, and when Pasa you have the bread no and the wine, you are going to be uh, uh, healed. This is not true. The Holy Supper is not ordered to the church to be made with the objective of the ailments and diseases of people to be healed. I'm not saying I don't want anybody to think, because in this world there is every, uh, a lot of things. Not, don't think that I don't believe in divine healing. I repeat again my testimony. I summarize it in three words. God saved me, freed me, and God healed me. I give, I say that God saved me, freed me, and healed me. I believe in divine healing. I have seen many, many brothers healed. We have prayed for paralyzed people in wheelchairs. I don't know if there is any brother from the Sanctuary of Faith of the Church of the brother Alberto Calini is watching me in the city of Rosario in Argentina, but I perfectly remember when they brought a girl in a wheelchair and the Lord at that moment gave me the opportunity to pray for her and in the name of Jesus she got up and she walked and next year when I came back to church uh, to preach in that church that girl came with her mother and said do you remember me? Yes, perfectly I will never forget you. I was the one that I came into this church in wheelchair and I never again sat again in that chair. I believe in miracles I have been seeing people here of cancer. I have to be seeing people healed of tremendous sickness but this does not mean that uh, we won't die and nobody feel bad please there are believers that they think that if they are not healed it's because they are in sin or because there is a curse uh, or because they don't have faith this is not truth this is not truth we cannot condemn any brother because we prayed for him and was not healed because we believe that when we, when we pray for a brother with faith with certainty in the Lord and the Lord takes this brother to his presence I believe that the Lord has all the right he's the one that gives and takes life he's the one that takes and gives life he has all the right to take us to his presence when he thinks is convenient so if I'm praying for a brother and my Lord decides to take him to his presence I will say glory to God you know what you do God is not unfair and God has done the best because what is the best for us for him to be healed for him to be one more year among us. He has 110 years, the old man, and we want to keep praying for him to be with us. But don't we say, sometimes we contradict the Christians ourselves. Don't we say the uh, Christians that, that Paul said, for me to life is Christ and dying is again? What is better, to be in this life or to be in the presence of the Lord? If the persons that are sick for which we have prayed, they did not get, he get healed, they are in the presence of the Lord. Those sick persons right now, they are in the presence of the Lord and join 100% healthy in the presence of the Lord. Isn't that better than be six more months or a year among us being sick? So, nobody has to be see, sad when a, a sister or brother that goes to the presence of the Lord but says Lord glory to you, to you because you know how to do things well and there is no injustice in you but sometimes we are so selfish that we believe that the fact that the brother is there six more months is better than being in the presence of the Lord what a barbarity what a nonsense See, the other day was telling someone when we are in the presence of the Lord Listen to me. Listen what, to what I'm saying. When we are in the presence of the Lord, we are going to say, Lord, how come I clung so, mu so much to life when this is the best place in the world? How is it possible that I waste so much time in, vanity, in vanities, in nonsense, when to be in your presence is the best in the world? So I give glory to God for the brethren that were not healed here, but they are healthy right now 
in the presence of our God. Varias personas están preguntando anyway, por we move on. De Lucas. Several Capítulo people 16. are wondering about the famous no and faithful butler bueno from Lucas chapter 16. I don't understand why it said that, well, uh, ma manage to make friends, so when riches are lacking, these friends help you. Well, it's just common sense. If I am a person that I'm doing things wrong, but let's say my economy in my life, I have made a series of friends, even though they were before knowing Jesus, then in a moment, in a certain moment, those contacts, those open doors, in a moment, maybe when my personal wealth is lacks, lacking, maybe they can help me. So it's not a story so hard to understand, like that story, that parable of the Lord, that the Lord also gave to us, that somebody he asked me why did was that man exposed from the wedding because he was not dressed properly to be at the wedding well because of that because he was not worldly dressed for the occasion for the wedding it's not the same the way we dress to go to a wedding that to go to the fields or to the beach to spend the day with the family each moment has its circumstances and has uh, we have to adapt to the circumstances in that story what is teaching is that that person was not giving the sign was not go worthy dress applied to the spiritual world if you are not washed by the blood of Jesus Christ changed by the power of God you cannot be in the presence of the Lord that is why he was kicked out of the wedding and what's the wedding the presence of the Lord how many are going will want to enter anyway anyhow without holiness when the Bible says that without holiness no, we, no one will see the Lord that dress that was not worthy of being there in that unworthy way applied to that text without Without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. So we have to let ourselves to be treated and changed and transformed by God. So in that way, we won't be expelled from his blessed, blessed presence. And there are some persons that also ask me about the topic of Kelvin, angels, seraphims that appear in Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 10. says, oh, is that an imagine? That's the problem, see? You don't have to imagine things. What you have to do is read the Bible and what the Bible says that's it and even if it goes against your imagination I imagine that the angels the seraphim the cherubims were different but now when I read Ezekiel chapter 3 and when you read Ezekiel chapter 10 I see that the seraphim the cherubims are different have a completely different from aspect from the one that I imagine then of course the imagination does not have to be used to interpret the Bible the hermeneutics and the Lord allowed me last year to publish a book that for me has been one of the most important that I could publish uh, about hermeneutics, the science that help us for the correct interpretation of the biblical text. And in no time, and I speak about imagination. Imagination is not, not a tool, a fundamental tool to interpret the Bible. Who said this? You have to use the biblical tools the biblical tools and what I have taught to you in those lessons and in that book to understand the word of God. But the imagination, the imagination can turn against you. In fact, as yourself recognize, you imagined the seraphims and the angels and the cherubims in a completely, in a way completely different from the one now that you have read the Bible. So leave your imagination aside and le get what the Bible of, uh, what the word of God says. Stay with what the Bible says. And finally, Let's see if there is another question. Yeah, in the Bible, um, I have read that God said the one that killed Cain seven times will seven times will be avenged. And Lamech, a, per a person called Lamech, said to uh, his wife, if Cain will be avenged seven times, Lamech will be avenged 70 times. In an act of pride, in an act of arrogance of Lamech, he said, well, if the one who killed Cain will be punished in a way, well, the one that kills me is going to be punished much more. As trying to say, my life is much more important than the one of Cain. If you have to avenge Cain seven times to me, 70. I'm superior, I'm more important. It's an act of arrogance and total and absolute pride for of Lamech that he wanted to be above what God had established concerning the life of Cain. Okay? 
que And in the other hand, uh, tell, let me tell you, my dear brethren, tenemos que estudiar más la Biblia. That we have Sobre to study the Bible more. We have to no study the Bible. Most pues, when you find uh, uh, words that you don't understand their meaning, then go to a good biblical dictionary. There is a lot of them. Uh, and also, you can find biblical dictionaries, uh, secular dictionaries that are going to help us to interpret the word of God, uh, to understand the words, but don't stop. Uh, uh, but keep reading and scrutinizing the Holy Scriptures is the only way that you can filter what you hear. How can you know if what you are uh, being taught and they are telling you from the pulpit of your church or from here, the one that is speaking, is speaking, is correct or not, is biblical or not, is from God or not? How can you filter things? How can you discern? By your imagination? No. No. I feel, I, I think, no. No. The word of God has to help us to check at all times how the, the Jews of Berea did. They check in the light of the sacred scriptures, scriptures where these things were or not like that. You have to uh, take time to see if what you are reading, what you are listening, what they are telling you is really biblical or not. I thank the Lord that I receive uh, more testimonies and messages from people that tell us, Pastor, I believe, uh, believe me, I have learned so much in these times, uh, during this last year, I have learned more than during all my life because they didn't read the Bible and when you don't read the Bible, then they can deceive you. They can manipulate us. How many times have we said the subject of the first fruits, the curses, the ties, this, that? How many atrocities have been said and have been taught and continue to be said in some pulpits? Why? Because the sheep, when they do not check what is, be, if what is being told is from God or not, they swallow it, they eat everything and they say above. All they say amen and they feel.